days, as well as uh, potentially future webinars as well. So with that, um, welcome to the Cook's Garden. Uh, the Cook's Garden is a presentation I've delivered previously in our units uh, in Joe Davis Stevenson, Winnebago County uh, this past winter. And I thought it was a pretty good one to kind of adapt for a webinar format. Uh, my name is Grant McCarty. I'm a local foods and small farms educator. And I'll tell you a little bit more about myself as we go along today. The Cook's Garden came from two places. I do a lot of work in the local food system. I work with farmers market vendors, with cooks, uh, chefs, and restaurants. I work some with community gardens and homeowners. And what I started to notice was that the chef would sometimes ask a farmer's market vendor if they could grow broccoli rob for them. And in turn, the vendor might ask me, well, can we grow broccoli rob in Northern Illinois? Well, there's some challenges that come with that. I also teach a lot of courses for homeowners, backyard growers, as well as master gardener volunteer groups. And we started to see that they were asking more questions on newer vegetable varieties that I was just kind of unsure about. Uh, so as I started to develop this course and started getting these questions, that's where part of it came from. I also cook a lot of vegetables in my home. Uh, for my family, we have a number of people who are vegan. I also grow a lot of things in the backyard setting. And I'm always kind of curious about kind of these new cultivars and varieties out there and kind of where they're coming from. And that's where part of it came from. A local need and a local uh, resource, as well as my own personal uh, curiosity when it came to today's um, growing these different vegetables. I want to be clear and upfront, though, that I am not a professional chef. I am a home cook. Uh, while I do enjoy cooking a lot of these vegetables, I'm not a professional chef. I also want to reiterate, too, that I am not a nutrition and wellness educator. We have a number of great nutrition and wellness educators and resources through U of I Extension that can provide that nutritional information. When I am talking about a certain vegetable and where its color comes from based on a compound, I'm not sharing with you what that nutritional value might be. When it comes to maybe describing how something is taste, how something is, is cooked, that is coming from seed catalogs and from other resources. So just wanna be upfront about that and kind of where I'm coming from here. All right, so that's my photo. Uh, as I shared with you, I am in Northern Illinois in Joe Davis, Stevenson, Winnebago counties. All three of these counties touch the Wisconsin state line. My programming area tends to be focused a lot in soil management, understanding what soil is and how we can better management. And this is a focus on both the commercial scale for those that sell at a farmer's market, pick your own orchards, but also for a non-commercial fruit vegetable scale, the backyard grower, the homeowner, uh, the community gardens as well. I do a lot of work in insect and disease management, and for the last four years, I've focused a lot in fruit tree pruning, pruning these in more successful fashion uh, on a small scale. We have a number of folks that are not from Northern Illinois joining us today. And I want to stress to you that I'm coming from planting zone 5B. Uh, for us, that means that the last spring frost is around mid-May. So for you all that might be joining us from different planting zones, you may find that some of the growing information I share with you is a little bit too, too late. You may be a couple weeks ahead of us uh, with this. I just know that we've got a different group with us today and just kind of want to reiterate that. You will find that the cultivars, the varieties I mentioned, are pretty true for, for most of you all when it comes to having good success with them. It may just be the planting is a little bit different based on where you're currently growing. So today's plan is going to start off with kind of rethinking the garden planning. And this is something that I am trying to do myself for this upcoming season. I am also trying to uh, help out my family a little bit better when it comes to the garden planning as well. We'll get into a number of the trends and vegetables, the sizes, the colors, the flavors, the yields, just where we're starting to see some different kind of more unique cultivars and varieties out there and where you may actually decide that you want to incorporate more into your backyard setting and your other setting as well. I'll get into the siding on your vegetables, maybe some certain things you want to think about when it comes to planting these, growing these in a backyard area, in a growing area. And then I'll also get into vegetable profiles today. General production, 
cultivars, selection, as well as harvest. While I will be talking about tomatoes and peppers, know that I'm not gonna go full well into kind of growing them and harvesting them. I kind of expect for some of the ones that most folks are growing, you're pretty familiar when it comes to what their needs might be versus when we talk about something like globe artichoke or sunchokes, you probably need some more information on the spacing, on the harvest, and just some intricate things that there might be needed when it comes to those. So that's what I've tried to kind of do as I develop today's class. This is broccoli romanesca, which you see here, very similar in profile to cauliflower. And we'll talk a lot more about this particular vegetable as we go along today. One of the things that I have started to do this season is to actually rethink what my backyard garden looks like. I think for a lot of us, we tend to just grow a lot of different vegetables. We harvest the vegetables, and then from there, we decide what we're gonna do with them. And you may not be this way. You may actually be much better about this. But I think for myself, for my family, and for a lot of folks, this isn't the case. So I really encourage you to really consider what you plan to cook, what you want to cook, and really what your family is eating right now. This has been something that I've tried to do to really think more about what we're cooking on a weekly basis and what we also want to eat this summer and during the growing season. For my family, we have a lot of folks who identify as vegan, so we eat a lot of vegetables. We also have Vietnamese in my family. We cook a lot of Middle Eastern food and dabble a bit in cooking those. We make a lot of hummus, we eat a lot of eggplant, we roast a lot of different vegetables. And this is what helped me as I started thinking more about what my vegetable garden might look like this season, was to really think about where some of these things are being used in the cooking and maybe where they're not being used. And it might be that I can step back and actually decide that I don't need to grow everything. I also tend to think about the purpose of a vegetable. When I grow tomato plants and I grow tomatoes to harvest, I am strictly mostly thinking of them to be on a tomato sandwich. Two pieces of bread, sliced tomato, some mayonnaise, that's all I really need from a single tomato plant, is to just keep producing so I can keep eating tomato sandwiches. That being said, do I need 50 tomato plants or do I need just maybe three or four if their sole purpose is that it's gonna go for a tomato sandwich? If you were growing, of course, more, more than you needed, this might be where you reconnect with uh, some of the food pantries in your area, especially this summer, I think there may be some more need for some of these fresh vegetables. Spacing and time will also be crucial here. We know that you know, spacing can get pretty tight for certain areas, so be kind of mindful of some of those vegetable plants that might be a little bit needier than others. And you might even think about starting the recipes and working back. The photo you see here is my hand holding sun gold tomatoes. Sun gold tomatoes are just wonderful cherry tomatoes, but I find that I grow too many of these every year. So I need to kind of step back a little bit and, and recognize that I don't need as many of these plants, but then maybe they could, if I grew too much, grow to it. So think about that. I think we're in a, a pretty good time to think more about the garden. One of the things that I did was I brought out everything. I looked at my recipes and my cookbooks. I brought them out and looked to find where the recipes might be, where my actual end products go. And then I also started looking at them with seed catalogs. This is normally not what we do. We usually have seed catalogs out. We take uh, stock of what our seeds are for, from the previous season and kind of go from there. But this year I actually decided to look at my cookbooks and to look at my seed catalogs together. And this helped me kind of figure out, okay, if I'm going to be growing okra, I have multiple recipes and two of my cookbooks that I like to use that these could go to that I've never tried out before. Or if I'm using, um, you know, growing cauliflower this season, maybe I found a good cauliflower recipe already. So potentially look at these at the same time. Our nutrition and wellness team also has a number of resources that have great resources when it comes to recipes. Uh, when I was thinking of showing a recipe and then kind of walking back a bit, what I found was this great Brussels sprout recipe, which we eat a lot of Brussels sprouts in our house and we roast them and really like them. And so as I looked at this recipe from the Eat, Move, Save website and kind of stepped back to see how much I needed, this recipe was calling for one pound of fresh Brussels sprouts. And in converting that, 
that tends to be yields from one Brussels sprout plant. Meaning that if this is a recipe I really like, and my family likes, and we cook it a lot, maybe then I could factor in how many Brussels sprout plants I might need. Um, in this case, you typically see yield from one Brussels sprout plant, although that's kind of a little bit low as we'll get into. So determining how many of these plants I might grow would then in turn maybe mean how many times I could replicate this recipe. Just something to think about as we think more of our garden. So let's get into what we're gonna talk about today. What are those vegetables that I've kind of been hinting at already? We're not talking about kale. I think for a lot of folks that grow kale, uh, it's becoming a garden staple in the backyard. We're kind of bored with kale. We're kind of ready to move on. I think is where a lot of folks are when it comes to some of those trendier vegetables we've seen the last couple of years. We're gonna talk a lot about some of these unique colors and shapes, where they're coming from, what compounds are in the vegetables that are giving that coloration. We'll spend a lot of time talking about the coal family, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, because this is where a lot of the kind of trendier vegetables are showing up, is within this kind of category here. Our root crops of carrots, potatoes, radish, beets, and sweet potatoes is where we're seeing a little bit more of the different colors and different shapes. And I think that's where you're gonna find a lot of newer ones to try as well is in the root crops. I do wanna mention peppers and tomatoes. I will introduce these, kind of give you a bit of an overview of some of the different colors and where that color is coming from and why you might choose this over another. In our family, most of our cooking starts with garlic and onions. And I think what you'll find when it comes to some recipes you're gonna try out or some cooking that you're commonly using, that garlic, onions, and other allium family members are used quite often. And so I wanna reiterate the, that group and give it its fair attention, if you will. We'll get into finishes like microgreens, and then we'll talk about seeds and grains. So what are those kind of like things like buckwheat or quinoa? or uh, oats or spelt, some of those newer grains that are out there as well as the seeds like quinoa, uh, and can they be grown? What are some issues you might run into with them? One thing to consider as you're thinking of vegetables and selecting them is to focus on the cups and the pounds. And this may be easy for you. You may kind of grow these vegetables every year and be able to kind of determine how much you get per plant, but it could be very hard, right? If you grow lots of heirloom tomato plants, you know that if the season is right, if they're given everything that they need, they tend to be very productive throughout that growing season. You may be ending up with a very abundant yields and crops that year. But sometimes you can actually get some research on expected yields. You will find sometimes that there is some information out there that can really help you determine how many pounds or how many cups you might get from this. And this can help you determine if you're planting too much. And I think that's what I sometimes run into uh, when selecting some of these. Every year I like to grow Jaradel. Jaradel is the blue pumpkin that you see here. Uh, it usually is a display pumpkin and yet it's a wonderful cooking pumpkin. Folks don't cook this as much as they should. What I have found that is that with one of these pumpkins, when I kind of cook it down and remove uh, the pumpkin to uh, then cook with, I can get about 10 to 12 cups. And I have a kind of a go-to pumpkin bread recipe that I use, and that tends to convert to about 12 pumpkin breads uh, throughout the season. That's kind of what I expect. So meaning that I probably just need one of these plants that would then in turn maybe give me two or three of these pumpkins. Here is some additional guidance that I kind of found through some research, through our extension websites and through some of our seed catalogs. Garlic, we see tend to see one bulb equals about six to eight large cloves. Brussels sprouts, we see about 10 to 15 sprouts per plant, about one and a half pounds per plant. Dry beans can vary considerably from a tenth of a pound to about half pounds of dry yield per plant. Sweet potatoes, one and a half pounds, to two and a half pounds per plant. I think this estimate is a little bit low, personally, from my experience of growing sweet potatoes. Pumpkin, three to five per plant, potentially nine to 15 cups per pound. Quinoa can be pretty low, you see 0.375 pounds per plant. Butternut squash, four to five per plant eight to 10 cups uh, per plant. I also think this estimate is pretty low for butternut squash. 
honey nut squash, and I'll show you what this looks like. We see 10 to 20 squash per plant, and then sweet peppers, maybe three to six pounds per plant. So it can vary considerably, and I think it depends highly on what that cultivar is, what that variety is, and what your season looks like. But this, of course, can give you some estimates uh, with it, and there's estimates out there um, through many different resources. Right now, I think it's important to recognize that you may need to order seeds or plants. What I find that many new kind of trendy vegetables just aren't locally available as transplants just yet. At least in my area where our home and garden centers are, I have found some, but I haven't found everything. We also find that for some of these newer ones that have been developed, many can be pretty expensive. Uh, some of them are 30 seeds for $6. And this may be fine, this may be all you need, but recognize that the cost can be there. I found, especially for those kind of more uh, popular tomato plants, you will find that this can maybe is 15 seeds for sometimes three to four dollars. So it can be a little bit expensive, just keep that in mind. It's important right now, I think, to really right, reach out and figure out where to order your seeds and plants. As I have looked through some of the seed websites over the last couple of days, many of them are very much being inundated um, due to sales and so forth. So you may have a backlog and the next couple of days will be pretty crucial, especially to figure out where you're gonna get some of these. I find local transplants usually a Brussels sprouts, sweet potato, onion sets, unique tomatoes, peppers, and cauliflower and broccoli. So I will grow some tomatoes indoors, but typically if I can find it and if it can work for the season, I'll try to depend on other home and garden centers for some things. You may find local seeds pretty commonly in the seed, uh, seed aisle for a number of these kind of trendier vegetables, I tend to notice with this. You probably are going to need to order things like sunchokes, purple, blue potatoes, artichokes, grains, and any kind of other really unique colors. Specifically, I think of cauliflower, I don't tend to see those seed packets too often or those transplants too often for say purple cauliflower or orange cauliflower. Um, so you may need to order them. This photo is broccoli rob. We'll talk a little bit more about broccoli rob today as well. You may also find that you need to start your seeds indoors. You know, for certain cultivars varieties you want, you may need to do this. And I recognize fully that we are up against a crunch right now. In Northern Illinois, a lot of our cool season crops are gonna go out at the end of August, of April, rather. And so we only have a couple really weeks to get some of these started indoors. We could push it back a little bit. Um, and ideally, we're aiming for about six to eight weeks head start in soilless media. So some of these could be started as transplants like tomatoes, peppers, and herbs. These could be started as seeds indoors right now. We would be planting them end of May, about the week before Memorial Day weekend and do pretty well. Beets are included in this as transplants because a lot of folks are now starting their beet seeds indoors and having pretty good success with that. And if you've had poor success with beets before, it may be that you actually decide to start them indoors because people are having some pretty good success with them. Broccoli cauliflower, you know, these are ones that would go out at the end of April, may be able to start them indoors for a couple weeks and then get a little bit of a head start, or this may be something where you direct seed them. I include squash here, although I know a lot of growers who don't always start their squash indoors, but you could start squash for three to four weeks. As I work with a lot of folks that grow on small scale up to the commercial scale, what I tend to see and what I tend to notice is every backyard is a little bit different. And I think you have to recognize that, that sometimes that these cultivars, varieties, and new vegetables you might be growing may take off and do great in the backyard, or it may be a very poor season for them due to different circumstances. Many of them need to have increased soil temperature for root formation. This is especially true for sweet potatoes. In most cases in Northern Illinois, we recommend sweet potatoes started from slips and plants the first week of June. What you run into is that sometimes the soil is just not warm enough in June for them to really take off and grow. And so you may need to adapt and increase that soil temperature in some capacity, which we'll talk about more today uh, in the sweet potato section. You may also need to create more of a friable soil. And what I mean here is kind of fluffy, create more of that fluffy, 
cookie crumb kind of texture in order for your root vegetables to really thrive. This could be the addition of compost. This could be the addition of other kind of things that might help more with some of the drainage and helping with that root formation. So you're really trying to get more air in there in order for the roots to really take off. You may be adapting resources from other states, and you may also think about using season extension and mulches to help with these vegetables as you get them growing. I will mention a number of cultivars today and a number of varieties, but one of the things that I do wanna stress is to try to taste and cook these if you can. A lot of the grocery stores, no matter their size, are tending to carry some of these newer ones out there, these newer vegetables, and I encourage you to taste test them, cook with them, see if they work well for you before you plant them. I recognize we're in a bit of a time crunch, and yet I still wanna stress this because you only have so much space in your backyard growing area. One of the resources that I use when it comes to finding a cultivar is to use pickacarrot.com. It acts as a search engine and allows me to kind of go through a number of different seed company websites by using kind of the search engine. It helps me find the seeds. It helps me also a bit with um, finding sometimes better prices and so forth. University of Wisconsin has a research project called Seed to Kitchen Collaborative. This is a wonderful research project because it incorporates chefs in the Wisconsin area, farmers market growers, and it also incorporates homeowners. And so what happens is that they try out different cultivars and varieties and they grow them uh, in a research setting and then they have chefs cook with them and then they have homeowners taste test them and then they also have farmers market vendors grow them. So you get lots of different perspectives to see whether it's a variety that you might want to do. And they do a lot of taste testing, which I really encourage and really like quite a bit. So that's a great resource. And they do tomatoes, onions, and lots of different other kind of plant families too. Vegetable varieties for gardeners from Cornell is a very good resource. The All American Selection comes up every year and U of I Extension's Good Growing blog just profiled this last month. And so you may find some good cultivars and varieties listed in there as well. There's a number of grower-focused seed companies. This includes High Mowing Seeds, Johnny's, Seed Savers Exchange, Row 7, Baker Creek, which a lot of us I think are familiar with, Dixondale Farm Onions, Territorial Seeds, Kitsdawa Seed Company that specializes in Asian greens and Asian vegetables. There's just a lot out there. You'll find a number of them. Um, these are just meant as examples. Please note that we are not endorsing any particular vegetable seed company, and these are just strictly kind of mentioned as examples for you. For a lot of these new cultivars and varieties, I think it's important to not generalize the vegetables you use. Some of these have been bred for a particular purpose, and you may find that while it is a beet, and we're calling it a beet, its flavor may be entirely different than any other beet you've ever eaten before. A lot of them can be bred for flavors to be enhanced through heating versus also eating raw. We sometimes see that listed in seed catalogs that, you know, if you hated beets, well, this is the beet for you. Or if you dislike tomatoes, well, try this tomato out because of this particular um, taste with it. So you may find the flavor you dislike may be rendered out completely. Um, the Badger Flame Beet, which you see here, a very robust looking beet. When you cut into it, you can kind of see this very intricate design. And yet they, the, the flavor compounds that I understand have been kind of enhanced where they don't have that earthiness kind of dirt, <laughs> soil taste rather, that a lot of folks tend to, to not like about beets. Some vegetables are also just better for a recipe. And this could be due to a lot of higher water concentration that we see with heirloom tomatoes. They tend to have a lot more water in them and they tend to just be better as a fresh eating tomato. And you'll see guidance that mentions that. Sometimes they may have a greater starch content, such as potato or carrot, which could also dictate what vegetable and what varieties you choose. And sometimes their sugar levels can also be bred differently. And you may find that, especially in pumpkins and squash. So keep that in mind as you look through some of these cultivars and varieties is that what you might love about one or hate about these may be not present. 
I've also noticed when I've gone to a lot of different community gardens, worked with a lot of homeowners, and seen in some of the food blogs that I read, is that we're seen on very small vegetables. This is very noticeable uh, when you look through certain seed catalogs. There's a greater trend in smaller size and shape. What we find is that they tend to have a far greater yield per plant, and you also may find that they have shorter seasons too. This is the honey nut squash that you see here. The ruler at the bottom is a 12 inch ruler, and you can see that it is kind of an individual butternut squash. Uh, it only gets about four to five inches in length. And for this particular variety, it has been suggested that you can't eat the skin. Uh, I purchased these this last fall. I cooked with them as I would traditionally cook most of my butternut squash and they then it tasted fine. It tasted like any other butternut squash. It was just smaller in stature. Magic Molly potatoes are another example. Lunchbox snack peppers are also ones that you see a lot of folks, excuse me, um, interested in because they are smaller in shape. Fairy tale eggplant, they produce very small eggplants about four inches in length as well, so very tiny. Baby bear pie pumpkin. So sometimes the names will be a giveaway that they're small, sometimes they may not be. Most of these should be pretty great for containers and you may find some pretty good success with them. I think many of these would also be great for community gardens or kids gardens as you're just thinking of having something more unique for the kids to look at and see. The small in size is sometimes where some of these things are going. What about that unique color? Will that maybe translate into a different flavor or is there good flavor behind it? It can vary. Sometimes there may not be as much flavor into them. Sometimes these colors will cook out of the vegetables and they'll no longer be present in those vegetables anymore. Sometimes these colors actually enhance the nutritional values of the crop. It just kind of depends on those compounds and yet again, kind of what the research shows. These, of course, can be showstoppers when it comes to growing in the backyard. Having some unique color, especially for a vegetable that you weren't necessarily expecting that color, you may find that it's just a, a great showpiece for what you're growing. Cheddar cauliflower, which you see here, a very newer, common one that a lot of folks really like. They have shared, uh, when I've talked to folks that grow this, that it has a bit more of a nuttier flavor to it compared to our traditional cauliflower. You will see a lot of blue, purple potatoes. In the blue and purple terms go back and forth when it comes to potatoes. You'll see purple pea shoots, badger flame beets, peppers, carrots, just lots of different color out there. And yet you may not get much flavor difference in them. It could just be they just look more presentable and they just look very different on uh, the, uh, when you're preparing it, cooking it, and serving for your family. Rainbow carrots is a pretty common variety that you'll see with seed packets and you also see it at a lot of grocery stores where they are selling kind of bags of these rainbow carrots. And the color comes from different compounds present in the carrots. With yellow, the yellow coloration, lutein is the main compound that's, that's giving this kind of yellow coloration to it. Anthocyanines is in the purple um, and this is what's giving that purple coloration to uh, the purple carrots that you might see. The white carrot, it lacks everything. So there is none of that traditional beta carotenes that you would see with your carrot, your traditional orange carrot, nor is there the anthocyanines, nor the lutein. Not pictured is the red carrot. That typically will have lycopene within it. Yet again, I'm just kind of telling you that this is where the color is deriving from. Uh, it's kind of up to you to, to look further into this. As I looked more into kind of where are these varieties originating from, in fact, they're coming from hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, the purple carrot that you see here originates in Syria versus the, um, the lycopene, the red carrot, uh, was coming from China and India. So these are very old varieties. It's just that now we've started to kind of grow them in the United States and kind of bred them with other carrot varieties that we have. So they're much, much older than, than I think we realize. So let's get into some of these varieties then and, and talk about these different family members. 
Broccoli rob also is called rapini. Broccoli flora, flower rather, is also called broccoli romanesca. And then broccolini. These are kind of your three kind of newer, trendier ones that have kind of shown up. For the broccoli rob, this tends to be a little bit closer in flavor to turnip. It also tends to be a little bit more bitter than broccoli, broccolini. Um, you can see that broccolini is kind of producing very small flowerets. The broccolini is a cross with Chinese broccoli and standard broccoli. So it is gonna produce small florets. It's not gonna produce that traditional broccoli head. What you may find with growing something like broccolini is that it may be easier for you to produce if you've kind of struggled with developing that full broccoli head. This might be kind of your avenue to consider. Anecdotally, I've heard from a number of growers who have kids that broccolini is a very popular one among children. Children tend to like the small florets and they like the flavor with it compared to the others. For your broccoli flower, broccoli romanesca, it certainly looks a lot like cauliflower and kind of produces kind of a more of a curd kind of shape to it. Most of the seed catalogs will explain that, you know, if you use it raw, it tends to taste like cauliflower. But if you cook it, it tends to taste like broccoli. And you may find that by choosing this particular cultivar that you kind of get the best of both worlds. You could get that, okay, I can prepare this, eat it raw like cauliflower, or I could cook it and it's gonna give you that taste of broccoli. So you may find kind of two things from there. So the broccoli rob, as you see in this photo, is not going to produce those kind of broccoli head or necessarily those broccoli florets that we see with broccoli. What you also are gonna run into is that there's not many cultivars available on the market. You're usually just gonna find that for broccoli rob seeds, there's just one packet. There's not multiple packets compared to beans, compared to tomatoes, compared to peppers. So it can be very few of these on the market and available to you at home and garden centers or from seed catalogs. You'll also note the maturity can vary considerably. For broccoli, this tends to be 74 days. For broccoli raw, this is 50 to 60 days. And for broccolini, this is 60 days. Maturity vary meaning that when I could actually harvest it and actually use. And a lot of this, of course, gets back to, you know, they're not developing that full kind of broccoli head um, like broccoli raw or broccolini would be doing. I don't have mentioned broccoli romanesca. Uh, it's probably gonna be in the same window of broccoli because it is developing that kind of full kind of curd head to it. Spacing can also vary considerably. For broccoli, this is about 12 to 24 inches in row. Although for a lot of us that grow broccoli, I'd probably push that to about 16 to 24 inches because you still are gonna produce a pretty big broccoli plant. Broccoli rob is eight to 12 inches in row. Broccolini is eight to 10 inches in row. So spacing is gonna vary considerably for broccoli rob and broccolini. Maturity will also vary considerably for both of those as well. And that may be very helpful for you uh, when it comes to uh, growing the, both the rob and the broccolini compared to the traditional broccoli. For cauliflower, the yields tend to be about two pounds or three to four cups of flowerets per head. One of the crucial decisions you have to make when it comes to growing cauliflower is the blanching versus the self-blanching. What this means is that to develop that white, good-looking curd that you're expecting this upcoming season, you have to either do the blanching process or it will be a self-blanching process. The blanching is that at a certain point, I will then tie the leaves of my cauliflower around the cauliflower head, blocking out the sunlight, in order for this white curd to develop. If it's a self-blanching cauliflower, it has been bred so that the actual leaves will begin to form around the curd and block out the sunlight. So you don't have to do that step. But this is going to be pretty crucial and you'll find information as you decide on your varieties that will mention this one way or the other. The orange cheddar color actually is a genetic mutation from the 1970s. So it's just more regularly become available these seeds have. Beta carotene is also present in this variety as well. Graffiti, purple of Sicily, those are very common purple uh, cultivars of cauliflower. These are very old varieties too. And this is anthocyanin is present 
in them as well, which gives that kind of purple coloration, which you see here. Uh, broccoli, I'm sorry, the purple cauliflower, when cooked and prepared, tends to not lose its color. Some of those white cultivars to mention here, the self blanche, the snowball, the andes, the snow crown, and snow grace, you'll still yet want to get, want to make sure this is a blanching or self blanching one, depending on the situation. You can kind of see in this photo with the cauliflower, that kind of self blanching where the leaves are actually growing above and trying to cover that white curd as it develops. If this does not happen, if it's a blanching or a self blanching and it's allowed to get hit with that sunlight, it could turn green, it could just be a very poor flavor compared to it. This blanching process is about eight to 10 days later once you've developed this uh, and started to do this process. Brussels sprouts have a very long season. And this is one of the things where, especially in Northern Illinois, we tend to make the mistake of planting them too early because I think a lot of times the Brussels sprouts plants are already available. They're near the cabbage, they're near the broccoli plants. And so we just kind of instinctively think, okay, I'll plant them at the same time. And yet Brussels sprouts actually need to be planted much later. We actually want to plant them the first week of June and harvest into that late fall period. They can withstand a lot of those freezing temperatures. And so we can actually see that later into that fall is when we might be planting them or rather when we will be harvesting them um, with them. You could see the actual kind of stalk of the Brussels sprouts, the Brussels sprouts plant and where these sprouts develop, kind of right where the leaves will meet the main stalk of that plant. There's a number of cultivars on the market, Jade Cross, Franklin Hybrid, the Long Island improved. All of them tend to be pretty good across the board when it comes to their performance. Spacing is, is crucial here, 18 to 24 inches between your plants. This actually maybe may wanna push more towards uh, kind of that 20, 24. Yield can vary depending on that season. So you might be one and a half pounds to three pounds of the sprouts. And then harvest when they're about an inch in diameter. This could be done individually or as the whole stalks. It's kind of up to you at that point which route you'd want to go. If you were to harvest the whole stalks at once, you would want to check to make sure that the bottom Brussels sprouts are at an inch in diameter, and then make sure the middle is at an inch, and then finally the top is at an inch as well. Because if you harvest the whole stalk and you've just inspected the bottom Brussels sprouts to see if they're ready to be harvested, you may find that not all of them are actually ready at that point. But it's kind of up to you which one you want to do. The root vegetables tend to like very loose and well-drained soil. That's really what you're after here when it comes to having good successful yields from them and having them develop well. When folks ask and have struggled with some of these, you may find that you need to do a raised bed. That could be something where, especially now, you build a raised bed, you grow them in a container, you allow for good moisture, good air exchange, and that may be how you have more success with the root vegetables compared to growing them actually into the soil in your backyard area because they really need loose and they need well-drained soils at this point. As shared with you, beets could be started as transplants. You could start them indoors. I know I'm going to be doing that in a couple weeks when it comes to my uh, badger flame beets that I ha are, am going to grow this season. Most others, like carrots, like radishes, we are not going to recommend starting as transplants indoors. You're going to have a much better success rate actually starting them in the soil and growing them in the soil or in your growing area. Carrots also tend to be sweeter if growing fall to winter. What happens is that, especially as the soil temperature cools, we start to see a shift in the starch of the carrot, moving it into converting more into sugars. So that's where we actually tend to see them kind of sweeter if grown that way. You may also find edible greens with radish and beets. Both of them tend to be edible tops to them. Some of them are a little bit better than others, depending on that season. Your cultivars, non-orange carrots, Rainbow F1 is the variety that you see here in this top photo with the multitude of just different colors um, there. Uh, right beside it is a dragon variety. 
And so this is one that has more of that distinctive kind of reddish color, although probably has a little bit of kind of a purple color to it as well. Starburst, Yellowstone, Stone rather, those are other ones to mention. White Satin is also a non-orange carrot too. I should also mention that when it comes to the cultivars I am recommending, a lot of this is coming from just different extension resources and different research that we have too. Beets, the badger flame you saw on the previous slide, kind of how big and massive that beet looks uh, compared to some of our other ones. The Chioga beet is where a lot of folks are looking more at, and you can see that one pictured here, kind of a, a whitish circulation within its red purplish flesh. Bull's blood, um, another one, very dark, rich, red, burgundy color to it. For radishes, Easter egg is the one that's mentioned here and shown in this photo. These have just a wide range of just different colors uh, to them and perform well. Cherry bell is a traditional radish, very good, grows well, very good success with cherry bell. Uh, French breakfast and comet are a couple of other ones to mention here too. Especially when it comes to different shapes and different colors, you're going to find a lot of different cultivars within the root vegetables. Uh, to pick and choose. And many of them, as I share with you, can easily be started outdoors in the next couple of weeks. Now on to something that maybe you've heard about, read about, but don't really know much about just yet. And let's talk a little bit about Jerusalem artichoke, and, which is also called sunchoke. It's a root vegetable in the sunflower family. And what is interesting about it is that while it's given this name artichoke, there's no connection, no botanical connection with this globe artichoke whatsoever. So it will produce the roots which you see here, which are what we use in cooking. Um, it is a good alternative to potatoes. They're roast, baked, fried, boiled. You may be able to find a lot of these at, at your grocery store as well to try them out. And the reason to try them out is because it does contain inulin. And I've heard from a number of people who have grown it that they have been very sensitive digestively to the inulin. And you may find that you're sensitive to this as well. So be kind of very cautious and do some research on growing this. That while it is edible and folks like to grow it and eat it, some folks are very sensitive to it and they will find that they have some digestive issues. So I cannot fully put this in my presentation without mentioning the inulin compound, and you may have a digestive sens sensitivity to it. It is also one that while it is not a perennial, it certainly could become one. It could become invasive in your growing area if any of these are kind of left behind um, with when you're growing them this season. So kind of keep that in mind is that it's a root vegetable and you may have some issues related to eating it and so forth. You can see photos of what the, the flower looks like. You see the sunflowers here. So yes, it is in the sunflower family. It produces beautiful sunflowers. You can see that bottom photo of it growing and kind of what it looks like. Some folks are actually kind of growing them in raised beds and in containers in order to actually just kind of keep them from being kind of grown all over the place. But yet again, you know, if I'm harvesting the Jerusalem artichoke and I've left any behind, it's possible that it's going to kind of take over and grow yet again that upcoming season. So a raised bed might be a better option when it comes to it. Not as many cultivars on the market for this one. I see stampede pretty often. Spacing tends to be four inches deep, 12 to 18 inches apart in rows, and about 18 to 36 inches apart um, between those rows. Planting dates is about two to three weeks before the last frost. So in Northern Illinois, this would be about the first week of May is when these would be planted. Harvest tends to be late summer into fall. Frost will improve their flavors. So you could keep these growing in your area up until the last frost. For Northern Illinois, this tends to be the first or second week of October. But as I've shared with you, be a little cautious with this one because the seed catalogs and computers are not always mentioning that inulin compound and the sensitivity that folks may have with it. They're tending to market it up as a good starch alternative and yet you may have some, you may have a sensitivity. So the globe artichoke then, 
you see this a lot um, in, in lots of different planting zones. And commonly, it's grown in a perennial and lots of warmer planting zones. For us in Northern Illinois, we could grow it, but we need to grow it as an annual. And that's something that you need to consider with this, is that you may have to experiment and you may have some good success when it comes to uh, keeping it growing for between seasons. But in most cases, it needs to be grown as an annual. What I have found when I've looked at home and garden centers, I haven't found the transplants. I've actually started these indoors as seeds. And so I will be growing them this summer. And if you have grown them before, I always love to hear what people like or don't like about them. So feel free to put that in the chat box. It is one that's potentially a container plant. You also find that you need to trick your artichokes. You need to have them get acclimated to some colder temperatures, typically in the 40s and 50s during the growing season in order for them to actually produce the artichokes, which you see here. If they do not get this kind of trick, this check-in with the temperatures, it's liable that they may not produce artichokes that season. There are two cultivars I have bolded, Green Globe and Imperial Star. Both of these are mentioned as cultivars that should produce artichokes if you are growing them as an annual. While Tempo and Violetta are also two other good cultivars, you may not have them produce that artichoke that you're wanting that season. They may actually struggle because you're basically adapting a perennial plant to become an annual, and it may not be as willing to go along with that plan. But the Green Globe, Imperial Star, are two that have been recommended to me. Spacing about four feet apart, so pretty wide spacing for these because they will get very big and robust. They also tend to need full sun, and you'll harvest your artichokes at about three inches in diameter. For some of the folks that I know that have grown these in Northern Illinois, they say they produce such beautiful flowers, and so it's a great kind of addition, kind of landscaping side to your growing area this season, and potentially you could get some artichokes out of them. So on to potatoes. These tend to be spring planted. For Northern Illinois, this tends to be mid-April, although a lot of folks will actually push that back into May so that the soil temperature can warm up a little bit more and they can actually start their tuber development. You will most cases purchase these as seed potatoes. These have been uh, bred uh, purposely so that they should yield for you and grow for you in your growing area as seed potatoes. I find that classification is pretty important, especially on the end use, where certain ones may have a different starch content or a different sugar content, and they may just not perform as well for me when it comes to what I want to do and what, how I want to cook them. Yellow tends to be ones that's great for mash, for salad, for steamed, boiled. Red is roast, mash, salad, and stew. Russet tends to be for baking, frying, mash, roast. Fingerling, smaller fingerling potatoes is pan fry, roasted salads. And then petite, very, very small potatoes that you may find pretty good success with salad, roast, and fry. And yet again, you know, this is my perspective as just a home cook and some of the other information that's out there from some of the seed catalogs of where these could be used in some of your cooking. What I tend to see is that a lot of times the seed potato cost is based on the shipping. The shipping can be pretty expensive when it comes to growing these different types of potato cultivars. So look around, kind of look and see what options are out there because that may be where you run into some issues. The purple, blue, red flash, and skin, these are very much older cultivars and older varieties. Most of them originate from parts of South America. They have now kind of been bred and introduced in some of the potato breeding programs that we have in the United States. Most of the time, these color compounds are coming from the presence of anthocyanines or the lack of them or just different levels, kind of giving those different colors. A couple of them are also mentioned as being low in the glycemic index. Um, and so those are ones that you might look at too. Most of them also tend to be pretty good for multi-purpose. These include things like Purple Majesty, which is bred out of Colorado, Mountain Rose, Adirondack Red and Blue, Magic Molly is a blue purple potato. Uh, I've ordered some of it, so it should be arriving shortly. 
Huckleberry Gold is the one that you see here, and this is one that has been mentioned, and there is some research that does show a very low in glycemic index, and so you may find some potential for that one. I don't yet see it at the grocery stores where I'm currently located, but I am starting to see folks try to grow it in the backyard at farmers market vendors too, the Huckleberry Gold. I also have Huckleberry Gold coming to me in a couple of weeks to be planted during this growing season. Just some further information on growing potatoes. I think a lot of folks are probably pretty familiar with this, but just know that you're after two good eyes and these are about the size of an egg. You know, for a lot of folks, you will be growing your potatoes in the next couple of weeks. And I do have a blog post I'll share with you at the end of today that goes into more detail on growing potatoes, particularly some of these newer kind of cultivars and varieties. Ideally, if it's a standard potato, 10 to 12 inches apart, two to three inches deep, about two to three feet between rows. This can be very different for fingerling potatoes, so for very smaller potatoes that you'd be planting. You may also think about doing a trench because the trench would allow you to then have all this extra soil to then uh, bring up onto either sides. After your potatoes emerge, you'll hill up the soil four to six inches high. And harvest tends to be when the vines have yellowed and they've died, but certainly before they're totally brown and dry. You could also do a shovel or a spading fork. It's really useful for digging up these. And then ideally you might leave a little bit of soil on it just to let it kind of dry out and kind of protect kind of the outer skin when it comes to these potatoes yourself. So the allium family is garlic, leeks, onions, and a lot of other ones that we'll talk more about today. In northern Illinois and parts mostly central Illinois, you tend to want long day varieties. These just really start to develop that full onion that you're after. And so as you look to different cultivars and varieties, you want to go towards the long day varieties more than the others. Leeks need to be trenched. The soil needs to be moved to cover the white part, which you see in this image here of, of these bigger leeks, although a couple of the leeks look kind of small. Elephant garlic is a type of leek, one that a lot of folks tend to like, and it produces very well in our planting zone, but know it's a type of, of leek. Some of these cultivars for white onion, red onion, and leeks are listed here. For white onion, the Walla Walla Sweet, a very common one that a lot of folks in Northern Illinois grow and tend to like really well. Yellow and white sweet Spanish is another one that does pretty well, performs well. Dakota Tears, Cortland, Sedona. For your red onions, Red Hawk, Lush, Red Carpet, Milano, Leeks, uh, American Flag, Giant Musselberg, King Richard, Latanya, and Poncho. A number of these cultivars you may find locally, um, but some of these you may actually need to order your seed sets um, from, from as well. So it may depend on kind of where you're at and what your growing situation is. Some of these other onion types, the ramps, the wild leeks, these need kind of a perennial bed. Seeds can be ordered and bed established. So you can grow your own ramps, you can grow your own wild leeks, but it can take a number of years to get that perennial bed established so that then you could be harvesting from it. Uh, some of our growers that have done this, they've said it's taken five to six years to get that perennial bed established where they could then start harvesting from. It. The green onion is a true onion that is immature. It's no different than any of the other onions that you might purchase as seeds or as sets. It's just it never develops that full onion that we're expecting. You also see multiplier onions. These are very similar to green onions in their shape, in their yields. Pearl onions is a short day onion grown under long day conditions. So it doesn't form fully when it comes to the pearl onion. In the last couple of weeks, I've seen a lot more recipes on shallots and cooking with shallots on a lot of the food blogs that I've been following and some of the chefs that I've been following too. So I'm not sure where that's coming from, but there's a lot more people looking at shallots. They look very similar to true onions, but they develop small clusters of bulbs. They're harvested when the bulbs are two inches in diameter. You can see the shallots here. So they would develop a little bit more smaller kind of bulbs on either side. You can kind of see in a couple of those photos too, what look like two kind of shallots forming beside each other. Scallions will also be mentioned as bunching onions. A true bulb will just not form. 
So for some of these, you will just expect that the full bulb will not form, while other ones, you may actually have to harvest them, such as a green onion. You're gonna to have to harvest it when it's immature versus a scallion where it will never form that true bulb shape. When deciding on what you need to purchase and how to go about doing this, a lot of folks are using sets. So this is where you're kind of purchasing a number of these, um, a bag or two that may have small dormant bulbs. Sometimes they have information. They actually give the cultivar name, which is great. But sometimes they may just say that these are red onion sets. And you don't get a lot of information out of that. As you are planting these, if there's anything larger than a nickel, these tend to bolt. And so you actually wanna use them as a green onion. I think for most of us, you're at a place where you don't wanna start your onion seeds indoors. We just don't have enough time when it comes to actually planting these. So if you can, I would push you towards the seed sets or rather the sets and the transplants, you know, trying to find some transplants that you, if you can, just because these have been started for about 10 to 12 weeks. Cloves is what you're purchasing for garlic. And keep in mind, there's a direct correlation in clove size and bulb development. These also should be direct seeded. So you will not actually start these indoors. For your harvest of these onions, fresh onions, we tend to see 15 to 25% of the tops are fallen versus a storage onion where 50 to 80% of tops are fallen. If you look at this photo here, we're looking at a storage onion. You can see that the tops are just very much dried out. Um, we're at 50 to 60% for most of the onion bulbs that you see there with their tops that are fallen. Green onions around 60, or rather, I'm sorry, around 30 days if it's from a set or a transplant, and it's 40 to 50 days if it's from seed. So you could purchase onion seeds right now and plant them and grow them as green onions. You might have a fine success with that versus onion sets where you could start them and then harvest at 30 days. Leeks, the width needs to be a one fourth inch to three inches, and this depends highly on the variety. As shared with you previously, you do need to kind of hill up these leeks, especially as the white part is moving upwards on the plant. You may also consider straw mulch into late fall that can sometimes help protect uh, these plants too. When I teach a lot of my master gardener classes for the vegetable section, and when I do a lot of other kind of vegetable education, I get a lot of questions about garlic. And this is one where in most cases, we tend to recommend planting in the fall six weeks before the freezing soil, September to October. However, you're probably in a place where you might decide to do spring planting. And if you're doing the spring planting, yet again, you know, you do still want to use like a hard neck variety, but you may find a greater success with this, especially depending on your, on your season. As I share with you, every backyard is a little bit different, and so you may need to experiment with it a bit. But as I've talked to more growers that are doing spring garlic, they tend to say that they don't have to put any mulch down, which is kind of a benefit here. If you were to do fall planting, as I share, six weeks before freezing soil, that tends to be in October and September, kind of the first week of October, uh, mid-September for garlic in Northern Illinois, and they need four to six inches of a straw mulch. And this is to protect, to insulate the garlic as it, as it grows. Hard neck is still the best suited for Northern Illinois. It will produce a garlic scape. I'll show you what that looks like. Keep in mind one garlic clove equals one garlic bulb. And there is a direct correlation between garlic clove and bulb size because it's basically cloning itself. That's kind of what that clove is doing. The scapes will appear and these need to be removed and keep growing. It's also edible. You can eat these garlic scapes uh, and use them as fresh garlic uh, within some of your cooking. This is the garlic scape that you see here. So during the growing season, usually about two to three weeks before your actual harvest, this garlic scape will appear uh, growing out from your garlic bulb. It looks a bit like a green snake in the garden. And you just kind of want to trim it right where it actually kind of, kind of a couple inches right where it starts to curve. Because what's happening is that the garlic is sending its energy up towards this scape. And you could actually lose between 25 and 30% of the growth of your garlic while this garlic energy is going up towards the scape. 
So you want to remove that. If you are going to be growing garlic this season, keep the paper skin on. Depth should be twice the height of the clove. And then spacing will be about three to six inches, 12 to 36 inches in between rows. Varieties, Hardneck, yet again from Northern Illinois, Georgian Crystal, Music, Carpathia, and Spanish Roja. Harvest tends to be two, three weeks after escape appears. I tend to just kind of test the bulb to ensure the paper skin has developed, then hang out to air dry five to six weeks. Keep the dirt on at this point too, because you still want to have as much of that kind of paper skin on the garlic as you can. Microgreens, just barely germinated leaves. We tend to see them two to three inches in height. And typically this is after planting in a flat. We see the seven to 21 days. They didn't have very concentrated flavor. But they tend to be used in to finish off a dish is what a lot of folks will use them for. Know that these are not sprouts. You're actually growing them in a soilless media somewhat like the seed starting mix that you might be starting your other transplants in, but they're not sprouts and you're not growing them like sprouts. These seeds can be expensive, but they can also be fairly easy to grow. It includes a lot of the coal family, like arugula, kale, radish, broccoli, broccoli rob, bok choy, Asian greens are included as well, and some of those lettuces too. You see a photo of what these microgreens look like. Very small. These would just be things that might be added to finish off a dish. Not necessarily something that you would just be growing them and that would be your <laughs> main mill. These are indoor planted and growing and they're also growing in a soilless growing media, flats, or with containers to grow with them. What we do see is the seeding rate is really heavily seeded. And sometimes this is one tablespoon per kind of black flat container. And you can see the speed, the seeding rate here within this photo is that it's heavily seeded. They're kind of growing against each other uh, during this process. You harvest with, a scissor, with scissors at the base of the plant. It's almost like you're cutting kind of loose leaf lettuce uh, within it. And of course, other good growing practices would be to wash this, wash the transplants once you have cut them and prepared them. We could spend a couple hours on the seeds and grains of the vegetable garden and yet I just want to kind of introduce them because this may be where your next uh, next efforts are when it comes to growing in the backyard. They may require a larger growing area than expected. I think that's certainly true for some of these seeds and grains. I wanna be clear though, that when we're talking about growing them, I'm not telling you to grow a half acre or an acre. I'm just trying to tell you a bit of what would be on a smaller scale. They could be planted individually, or you may find that you're just direct seeding them in a growing area, just kind of getting the soil bed prepared, scattering them by hand, kind of raking them in and watering. That may be where some of them are pretty successful then. I find that you're gonna do a lot of troubleshooting and also experimenting in this phase when it comes to growing your own seeds and grains in order to use. Some may need to be harvested and also processed a little bit further. For the summer vegetable garden, this is summer planted and harvested. Things like oats, buckwheat, millet, quinoa, all of those could be grown in the summertime in our growing area. Others will be fall planted and summer harvested. Wheat, rye, spelt. Meaning that in the fall of 2020, I would grow these three they would overwinter into uh, spring of 2021, and then I would harvest them in the summer of 2021. Versus buckwheat, where I could grow it in 65 days, or a little bit less than that, harvest from that, and kind of be done with the season. You see here buckwheat. So buckwheat produces seed. It's one of the seed ones and uses beautiful flowers, which you see in this photo. And then from those flowers, it will develop kind of the buckwheat hull. Buckwheat is one that has a hard outer hull, so it is one that I have to kind of process a little bit more in order to actually get it. So some of the challenges that certainly hulling kind of with buckwheat, with oats, is where a lot of folks maybe will run into. And you have to kind of find some DIY out there to figure out how you could easily do this. Some of them require threshing, the removal of the grain from the plant. That can be very common for a lot of our wheat rye and some of those other grains you might be growing. You may also find that yields may be lower than you expect. 
I think that can be certainly true for some of these is that they may just not give as much yield as you're really expecting and as much planting area as you're devoting to it. Some of these have invasive tendencies, something like buckwheat. The, while it grows great, it produces a lot of seeds. And if these seeds are allowed to hit the ground, um, they can potentially overwinter into next season. And you may have invasive problems here when it comes to them. So I do encourage a test plot if you can. One of the great resources that I like and use is called Homegrown Whole Grains by Sarah Pitzer. She has a number of great information when it comes to actually growing these different seeds and grains. And what I like is it's a very backyard perspective, a very smaller plot focus compared to telling you to grow half an acre of quinoa in the backyard. So for some of the grains and some of the seeds, uh, just to mention here, buckwheat and quinoa are both seeds. They're summer planted. You can see the yields per 100 square feet is what I'm after. So if I plant buckwheat based on its seeding rate, I should potentially get between four to 16 pounds of buckwheat per 100 square feet if everything goes as planned. It's a very quick growing plant. It may, you may need to certainly address its outer shell. I do like that it can attract a lot of other pollinators for other crops. Quinoa, start seeds indoors as individual plants. They may be tricky for a planting zone and you need to remove that outer seed residue. That's one thing that we run into with that quinoa is you need to remove that outer, outer seed residue. Oats, they tend to be the easiest to grow, but you wanna look for a wholeless oat variety. I believe freedom is the main cultivar uh, of oats uh, that is a wholeless one that can work in a backyard. Spelt within the wheat family has a different gluten. It's fall planted and it's with June harvest. And it's growing in very similar to wheat in practice and in harvest. I didn't mention wheat or rye here. Both of those could be fine grains to grow in the backyard setting. Know that, you know, it could be that you're growing them in order to process into your own flour for baking or to actually be using in other types of cooking. Mentioning peppers and tomatoes just briefly. Um, Two broad categories for peppers, sweet and hot. And so the bell category then from there is California Wonder, Bell Boy, Lady Bell, Purple Bell, Chocolate Bell. The bell tends to be a giveaway that's gonna be a very bell-shaped uh, uh, pepper. Some of the hot peppers that have been recommended to me before are Primero Red, Red Ember, Red Flame, Ajio Rico. You'll see lots of things that list things like chocolate or purple. I find that there's not much flavor to them. I don't find that they actually have much different flavor when it comes to, to them. It's the chocolate pepper does not taste like chocolate, I'm afraid to say. Nor does the pepper, purple pepper taste like grape. Lunchbox peppers will be the small and size ones. And you see these a lot at grocery stores, but you can certainly grow those well and they would grow pretty well for you. There is a newer habanero without heat on the market. It's called habanada. And so it just has more of that habanero shape to it, has a flavor, but it doesn't have that heat level that you might be expecting or very hesitant to use. I find when growing peppers that yields vary considerably. Uh, sometimes this is five to six pounds of sweet peppers per plant. For hot peppers, you may see between 35 to 50 peppers on hot peppers. It can be quite, quite a wide range. We grew the gross chili pepper here in the University of Illinois Extension Demonstration Garden in Rockford. And this is from last summer. We were yielding between 35 and 40 per plant. And because it's such a hot pepper, that was enough. <laughs> that was enough for us um, because of its heat level being so hot. The Scoville range is sometimes what folks will see when deciding on pepper varieties, which is the measurement of the capacian. Zero is considered sweet bell, jalapeno, 2,500 to 8,000, uh, and goes on and on. Some of the hot peppers that we've grown in Northern Illinois uh, in our demonstration garden to try out uh, is ghost chili pepper, the Trinidad scorpion, and Carolina reaper. These are the hottest peppers as of right now. And so I, you will find that if you like pe hot peppers, these can be very prolific in planting zone five. When looking at tomato cultivars and varieties, they'll be classified based on their color. 
And this can sometimes help you figure out what kind of flavor you expect from them. Things like red and pink, they tend to be a bit more of a balance of sweet and acid. And you're gonna typically have that traditional expected tomato flavor. You shouldn't have too much differences when it comes to that. A purple or black tomato has a bit more earthy type of flavor. It has less acidic, acidity in it. Sometimes the color will also fade when it is cooked. So kind of know that that may not get you what you're after if you're trying to keep that flavor the color going. The orange, the yellow, they're a bit more mild. They're a little more sweet. They tend to be very low acidity compared to the traditional um, tomatoes that you might be growing. Green tomatoes, like a green zebra, zebra rather, less acidity, balanced, sweet, tart, flavor compound to it. You'll also see white tomatoes. It's not true white. It has a little bit of a yellow tinge to it or a green pigment. And it's considered the sweetest of the tomatoes because of this. Um, so you may have some pretty good success with them and like them because of that white nature to them. So this distinction can help you quite a bit when it comes to deciding. The green zebra is the one that you see here. So very nice kind of looking green coloration to, to it. Has a little bit more or less acidity. For a lot of y'all when thinking of tomato cultivars, you might be looking towards heirloom, non-hybrid, or open pollinated. Those three words tend to mean the same thing and are marketed the same thing. They tend to have a good flavor. They're very better for fresh eating in most, most cases. They have more water content, so they tend to not be as good for sauces or limited sauces. You may see kind of common disease issues and really just ugly looking tomatoes. When I grow these type of cultivars, I expect them to take up a big garden footprint. And I joke that these are tomato trees. These are not tomato plants. I'm growing tomato trees because they have such a big part of my garden and are heavy yielders for me. This is the pink Berkeley tie-dye, which you see in this photo. Uh, at maturity, at full color, it's the bottom photo, which you see, the bottom tomato. So it is a little bit more lighter in pink shade uh, than some of the other ones that you're used to. and has a bit of that kind of zebra coloration like green zebra does. Some cultivars and varieties to mention here, mortgage lifter, big beef, uh, those are two that are pretty common that folks tend to like. Italian heirloom has been taste tested in some of our University of Illinois Extension Master Gardener trainings and people like the Italian heirloom. Yet again, that was kind of purely anecdotal based on our Master Gardener volunteers, but a lot of them really like that one. Damsel is one that a lot of folks are growing now and they have a really nice success rate with it. It's a very traditional red tomato, yet it performs pretty well. For purple, black, Cherokee purple, very common tomato, which you see in this photo. I tend to grow Cherokee purple every year because yet again, the end goal is a tomato sandwich and it's a great tomato for a tomato sandwich. Pink Berkeley tie-dye I shared with you previously. Green, green zebra. Some of the white ones is the great white. You also will see Italian ice. This is a cherry, uh, a white tomato, a cherry sized one. Yellow and orange, Valencia, I grow every year. I love Valencia, very good flavor to it. Nebraska Wedding, Moon Glow, Kellogg's Breakfast, Lemon Drop, Lemon Pear, just lots of great tomatoes and cultivars out there. I always try every year to grow a different one just to see how I like it. I also tend to also grow the same ones every year too. But you're gonna find a wide range of flavor and of different uses for your tomatoes and in the cultivars you might be using. So sweet potatoes are planted from slips or plants around June 1st. For another planting zone that you might be in, you might be able to actually be able to uh, grow this much earlier. Uh, for us though, just based on our kind of planted zone in Northern Illinois, we tend to be about June 1st is what you're after. These need hot days and nights. And I know that's kind of like, well, what do you mean here? You're aiming for the 70s, you know, especially starting off. And so 70s during the day, 70s during the night. And we may find, especially in June, that we're just not there where it needs to be. You may need to increase soil temperature. And this could be that you use kind of a plastic that goes over it and typically a clear plastic is gonna be much more beneficial and let more sunlight in and allow for the soil to get warmer than a black plastic is going to. 
A raised bed or a container could also be an option to try to increase some of the soil temperature. And you might decide to combine it with the plastic and have a better success rate with it. I have grown sweet potatoes in raised beds before and combined it with a plastic and had very good success with it, trying to get those soil temperatures increased uh, in order for good, strong um, tuber development. Some cultivars to mention are Beauregard, Covington, Evangeline. These three tend to be ones that you will commonly see at a home and garden center, or you will see at seed catalogs and seed stores as well. Jet has been mentioned, but I've known, I've heard from a couple of growers that Jet tends to be a poor performer, especially in our planting zone. So I would, I would push more towards the Beauregard, Covington, and Evangeline. Yet again, this is purely anecdotal from what some growers have told me about Jet. Maturity tends to be 90 to 110 days. Yields one and a half to two and a half pounds per plant. And again, I think you'll probably get more than that depending on if you're getting that good warm soil temperature that we're after. You may occasionally see Japanese sweet potato. And so this one can be planted very similar to our traditional sweet potatoes. What we find though, it's a white flesh that turns yellow when it's cooked. And the Murasaka, which you see here, you know, is, is that coloration. It tends to be a little more reliable for roasting compared to orange. And you'll find a lot of research on some of the differences between the Japanese sweet potato versus kind of that traditional sweet potato that we may commonly be growing. Um, the Murasaka one is one that's very commonly found through seed catalogs, through home and garden centers as well, too. So you'll find that one, too. One of the last stages when it comes to harvesting sweet potatoes is you need to cure them. And that's something that I think a lot of folks, excuse me, don't realize or they kind of forget. And yet if they don't cure these, the sweet potatoes is not gonna be sweet. It's not gonna concentrate those sugars like it needs to. If you're planting them the first week of June, you're typically gonna dig just before the first frost in the fall. So you'll start to see kind of your vines might start to die just a little bit, but certainly look at your calendar and have an idea of when that first kind of 32 degree Fahrenheit frost might be coming in. Um, dig them up, allow to dry two to three hours on the ground. So kind of dig them up from the growing area, let them sit out, and then place in a warm room for curing for about 10 to 14 days. There's a lot of other information out there when it comes to the temperatures, but typically you do want to have it to be a little bit warmer um, than maybe it's used to. Then from there, store in a cool location. But you've got to have this curing process. You need to allow for it to dry out, them dry out on the ground, and then move to 10 to 14 days curing process. I mentioned squash just briefly. Just know yields can vary for winter squash. They can also vary considerably for pumpkins and others. We typically see two to three for pumpkins and squash. You could start them as transplants two to three weeks before planting, uh, or you could direct seed them into the soil at the end of May and have a fine season that way. It's kind of up to you at this point. There's a number of cooking varieties out there, Jaradel, which I showed you a photo of, Long Island cheese, Cinderella. Those are all very sometimes display pumpkins, and yet they're really good. Um, cooking pumpkins and cooking squash here. The blue Hubbard squash is, is shown above the, bra, the Long Island cheese. The blue Hubbard is one that folks really like. They like the flavor of it. They like to cook with it. It's also one that tends to attract lots of cucumber beetles. So it can be a trap crop, if you will, and kind of trap some of them. You'll see small orange pumpkins. Usually they're distinguished by something that says baby or small or sugar. Sometimes those are a distinction here. I've included a number of winter squash cultivars recommended here. This comes from Wisconsin. This also comes from U of I with some of the research we have. Orangetti is a spaghetti squash. By its name alone, we should kind of <laughs> figure it might be a uh, spaghetti squash. So I'm starting to wrap up here. Please go ahead and put some questions in the chat box and we'll get to them today uh, if I can get around to it. I wanna mention a couple of resources for you as you start planning out your vegetable garden this season and especially in the next week or two. The University of Illinois Extension has a number of horticultural blogs that are very active right now. The Good Growing blog with Ken Johnson, with Chris Enroth and with K 
Katie Parker, is very active in helping a lot of folks kind of get started with their vegetable garden this season. So kind of go to that resource because it's really, really good stuff and really good information. Flowers, Fruits, and Frass is another blog that Kelly Alsop uh, in Central Illinois is, is writing. And she has uh, created this guide called When Should I Plant, which you see here on the left. It includes a number of planting dates. It also is one that can be adjusted for Northern Illinois and Southern Illinois. So that's something that I would kind of look towards, especially as we think about what we're gonna be growing and when we can be, can be growing. I maintain a blog, Raise, Grow, Harvest, Eat, Repeat. So I'm trying to do a little bit more activity on that blog, especially during the next couple of weeks. I would be remiss in the Cook's Garden if I did not mention the work that our nutrition and wellness educators and team have been actively doing for the last couple of years. Many of them have blogs, websites, wonderful YouTube videos that go into actually cooking these different vegetables uh, and providing great recipes and resources when it comes to them. And so this includes things like the Illinois Nutrition Edition, Simply Nutritious, Quick and Delicious, Be Smart, Eat Well, Get Healthy, Healthy Eats and Repeats, the Nutrition Nosh, Turn Up the Beat, Nutrition and Wellness. Lots of great websites, blogs, and YouTube videos. So as you think of growing these vegetables this season, certainly look towards these resources to help with the planning, because I think you'll find some really great stuff uh, when it comes to it. So for a wrap up, you know, my 2020 garden plans, we've got Magic Molly potatoes coming in the next couple of weeks. I have five globe artichoke plants that have started, and so they will be planted shortly. Broccoli Rob will also be going into my garden, and then Badger Flame beets were also purchased. You also see Beauregard snow pea uh, in there as well. So look to plan your recipes now. You know, start selecting the cultivars now too. Combine both of them. You know, think of what great recipe could be used for cheddar cauliflower or graffiti cauliflower. You're gonna find you need to order your seeds and start them if you need to. And depending on the situation, you may not be able to start them so soon. And then experiment with new crops and planting. I think that's really what I'm after every year is to try to grow new things. And enjoy, gosh, I want you to enjoy your vegetable garden for the season. So that's my phone number. I know I'm a little hard to reach right now just as we've kind of adapted with our extension programming, but certainly I'm available via email during this time period. I will have this handout and a short evaluation for you later in the next couple of days as I try to, try to edit it some. We also have a Facebook page and we're doing a lot of Facebook Live events. Uh, and you can find us on U of I Extension's Northwest Illinois Local Foods uh, present, uh, Facebook page. So I thank you for the opportunity. Thank you all for joining me today. Um, I'm gonna get to some questions now. So give me one second. Okay, so a question Manu asked, uh, when would you plant fall, winter root vegetables? So a lot of them actually need to go out uh, in Northern Illinois towards the end of July and the middle of August because they, especially direct seeded, they do need some warm sun as well as some warm soil temperatures. So many of them are gonna be the end of July and mid-August. You will find in that research that resource of when to plant that it does include fall planting dates and so look towards that guide because that would help you uh, with some of it. Let's see Liz asks, does inulin level change with maturity for Jerusalem artichoke? That's a good question Liz. I've not seen anything to say that it might. You know I think that potentially it could but I don't think it's going to uh, strictly eliminate that compound. I think that compound is going to be there. Um, but I think just as other vegetables and the seasonality can sometimes impact it, you, you may see it, but I don't think it's fully going to be eliminated. Can sunchokes become invasive in Northern Illinois? Debbie has asked this question. They can. That's what a lot of folks are telling me is that when they have grown them, they have started to spread out. And so I think this is something to be cautious of is that while they won't be spreading out vine like Debbie, they are going to be shooting up their shoots every kind of single year. 
And so that could be something where you might want to consider growing them in a raised area. A lot of times, as I understand it, it is that one of the sunchokes has gotten left behind between the previous season. And so that's where it kind of emerges really fast. But as I talked with someone last, uh, last February, this past February, they said that the sunchoke performed great, but it became pretty invasive on them. Norman has asked, he's had trouble with squash bugs. What is the solution? So for the squash bugs, Norman, you might be able to grow blue Hubbard squash as a trap crop because squash bugs and cucumber beetles tend to like blue Hubbard. They may be attracted towards that blue Hubbard and it would be your sacrificial crop, if you will. So that would be what you might be growing. At the same time, trying to maybe keep the area uh, a little bit more um, cleaner than usual around the, the squash plants, because they tend to like to hide under the leaf material. And I would also look to try to eliminate some of their eggs early in the season. You'll see some guides out there that will show you what these squash bug eggs look like but they tend to be kind of a copper red color and they're underneath um, the, on the, other, on the underside of the leaves of the squash plants. So kind of killing them, kind of pressing them with your, with your fingers can sometimes be pretty helpful with it. It's not the best, I know they can get pretty all over the place though. Dickie is asking how to keep bugs away from the broccoli. I think I would first start off maybe using a floating row cover, Vicky. And so this could be put in place as the broccoli plants are developing. Uh, this would just be kind of a barrier to keep those bugs off of them. And because the broccoli does not need a pollinator, this could be in place for quite some time. Uh, you'll see it called floating row cover. And it's just kind of a barrier that allows light penetration in, and it still allows for water from any rain to come through the broccoli plant. And this could be put in place to kind of help create a barrier solution with this uh, situation um, for kind of the broccoli plants with it. Um, it would also keep some of those cabbage worms from getting to the broccoli plants because those kind of adult cabbage worms, those moths, tends to kind of get to the broccoli and lay their eggs that way. So look towards floating row cover um, to try to create a barrier for the bugs off of them. 